some threat intelligence. You guys don't seem too enthused. We needed to give out like espresso. Something. Oh, amen. Yeah. There you go. Something. Or beer. So, how many of you guys here in the room have a threat intelligence program where you guys work? Anybody? You guys evangelizing that at all? You guys talking about that, or is that even a an idea? I hear you. You're shaking your head. Yes. Yeah, you right there. <laughs> yeah. Do you have one in house, or do you guys like in the beginning stages? They don't even care. They don't care. Why don't they care? Is that? One store and they keep paper copies. They just don't care. Okay. How many of you guys are familiar with what threat intelligence is? One? Okay. So I hope to educate you guys on what what threat intelligence is and, and, and what it can do for organizations. Um, it's We call it zero day live, and it's just that. When zero days come out, we make them live. Like we promote that. So some of these slides are pretty self-explanatory uh, you know, from a statistic standpoint. Uh, cybersecurity it does affect everyone, even though, if, you know, I'm not going to pick on you, but you guys have just everything in paper. Uh, not everything is all on paper, right? So it, it, it does affect all of us uh, at some point or another. <clears throat> and again, I won't bore you with like some of these slides, uh, but there's a lot of, you know, every day you wake up, there's a new news story. Uh, we're, you know, the DNC, the Russians, and um, uh, Equifax, and all this, you know, want to cry and things of that sort. So there's, there's a lot of things going on that we see on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to, to cybersecurity. Industry is still the biggest target of hacks or cybercrime because that's where um, our credit cards live, that's where our, our, our health records live, that's where intellectual property lives. So that those are still going to be you know, your prime, prime targets for uh, cyber, uh, cyber crime. And if you guys have any questions in the, in the interim, just, just blurt it out. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty much a free-for-all here. So the only statistic here that I like to point out here is, is the top one is unknown. So I'm just going to use it 35%. Um, that basically means that when an organization is compromised, we go through some sort of incident response process, right? We stop the bleeding, you know, we've spent a lot of money on we don't know what, and then it's business as usual, right? Finding a root cause of, of why we were attacked and what attacked us, that's the unknown. We basically want to stop the bleeding and, and, and you know, move on with our day and try to explain to um, a board or a CEO that, hey, we just spent $5 million. Oh, on what? Ah, stuff, right? So this is how we describe or define threat intelligence, that it's, it, it has to be actionable. If it's just information, then, then it, it's, that's not threat intelligence, right? Um, it has to be in the context of a threat for our organization. So if you're in a manufacturing, uh, do you really care that you know, finance, you know, somebody's gonna attack a finance company? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe if it's the bank that you bank with as an organization, maybe? But it does present that, that harm to your organization. And, and by actionable, I mean you have to make a decision. What do I do? Do I you know, talk to the CEO about this? Do I put a firewall rule in? Do I block an IP? Do I you know, block a hash? You know, something like that. <clears throat> threat intelligence is not a SIM. It's not these insider threats that we sometimes think of. And, and saying bad things on social media is not threat intelligence. Uh, a lot of times people confuse that with threat intelligence where you know maybe our brand or our reputation may be at risk but it's not threat intelligence <clears throat> 
So we basically looked at building this platform uh, and, and tr reducing our th cyber threats by up to 50%. So what does that mean exactly? That's taking you as an individual, you have firewalls, you have URL filtering, you have spam filtering, you have an EDR solution, and you're one person putting on all the fires, right? But with this platform, with this idea, we can make those, every, every piece of that infrastructure smarter, right? Because now we have APIs, we have machine learning, we can do a lot of different things with a lot of this, this new uh, technology out there. So one of our uh, use studies that we use with a lot of our customers is WannaCry. Uh, that, WannaCry was the, the, the public name for it, but it was really was released by the shadow brokers. So everybody that was our client, our customer of, of this type of threat intelligence knew about WannaCry roughly 15 days prior to it actually hitting uh, the, the, the mainstream media. And that's when somebody in the mainstream media called it WannaCry because I guess because there's a lot of computers that made you want to cry, right? And there's a lot of um, news articles about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right, everybody, anybody affected by anything like that? It seemed like more like a, a global issue more than a United States thing, but regardless, um, the, the, the information was there roughly 15 days prior to it actually occurring. And that, that, in a nutshell, that is threat intelligence because when you get that kind of information and you can now take action on that, meaning you can block, um, what was the, 445, four, 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 right? Um, not, I don't know that anybody would have that open to the public anyway, but regardless, um, that's an actionable step that you can take. So, when we predict something like that based on you know analytics and, and the information we grab, as I mentioned here, 15 days in advance, we gave them this, our solution. Um, if you can think about having that data or that information prior to those types of issues occurring, what, what would that look like on a, on a global scale, right? How much, how much money would your company save by not having to be up all night for two weeks trying to fix something? Right, because a typical incident is what, Man, depending on it, maybe th th three to six months uh, of basically a lot of Red Bull and no sleep. So if you could somehow avoid that with information you would get, uh, think about some of the, the, the cost savings from something like that. Anybody have any questions so far? Anybody uh, uh, exposed to the uh, Equifax breach in here? Nobody? You guys are lucky. I, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would hope so. Um, but again, in in in, in the um, uh, Equifax breach, uh, we saw a lot of this information going on uh, almost three months before it occurred, and when. The, it was EquifaxSecurity2017.com came out. We saw a proliferation of other individuals or, or somebody registering a lot of domains that looked like that. And we actually, when we found that, we posted that on, on LinkedIn actually, saying that there's, uh, am I in trouble? Oh. Um, no, you're looking at me like I'm in trouble. Um, so we posted that on LinkedIn saying, hey, we see this you know, proliferation of these other websites that are being registered that look like this Equifax breach 2017. Be careful. And then sure enough, may, you know, shortly thereafter, uh, Equifax employees were sending their consumers to fake sites because they had no knowledge. Again, it would have been avoided altogether if they just used maybe a subdomain, right? They just said Equifax Security 2017 Equifax and you would have eliminated a lot of problems, but regardless, that wasn't the case. So getting back to, real quick before I move on here, um, Experian has that Experian slash scan. Has anybody done that in here? And basically what they do, they take your email and they search the dark web for you 
they say like 60,000 websites and file shares and no, nobody's done that in here? Well, if you, if, you, <laughs> if you want some real good entertainment, um, I would recommend you do it. So I did that with one of my emails. And it does say that it's going to take um, up to 24 hours to get back to you and after they scan everything. It took four minutes for them to come back and say, nope, we couldn't find anything. And I've had this email for like 10 years. So just to kind of give you an idea of what other companies are doing from a um, marketing standpoint or, or trying to, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, yeah, a total of four minutes, they scanned 60,000 websites. I thought that was pretty impressive. Um, so threat intelligence, what's the, what's the value proposition for, for clients, right? Why, why, why do clients need this? Why do we need, we need threat intelligence? Well, threats have doubled. Uh, a lot of our technology we currently use is all signature based. Our threats are getting very uh, intelligent. It's no longer the Prince of Nigeria asking you for money. It's typically your CEO, right? So that has certainly changed the landscape. Uh, this, the, 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 a lot of the uh, security operation centers are falling behind. And the security spend is based on failure, right? You're, you're, when you have an incident, there's no cap on your budget, right? We need, we need to stop this bleeding, right? So if somebody fail or something fails, some process fails, so let's, let's fix it and let's throw, you know, two, three million dollars at it. And security spend is based, uh, well, is, I have that in twice. I don't know how I missed that. That was the mistake. I was oh, I, I wanted to stress that <laughs> twice. That. Any uh, sys admins in here? Okay, so do you do a lot of patching? Um, I, I'm more of the, uh, the application administrator, okay. the server administrator, but yeah. So we, we, we just did a quick um, look back for the last 12 months of security patches for, Win, uh, for Microsoft operating system for their server, not any other product but their server. The uh, patch Tuesday comes out, there's typically anywhere between 32, well I should say 35 and 40 patches every Tuesday, every single Tuesday. So does anybody r understand what that means? I, 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 how I'm interpreting that, that basically means everybody at Microsoft is working at 110% capacity and that's the only ones that they can kick out every single week. Threat intelligence sees a lot of these vulnerabilities and, and these bad stuff out there faster than a Microsoft can. And I'm not bashing Microsoft by any means. I'm just saying that's humanly possible. It's, that's the most that they can kick out from a, a vulnerability standpoint. That's one of the problems, right? Another one of the problems is, um, you know, uh, the more secure you feel, the less you spend, right? So after that breach, everything kind of gets back to normal. Okay, let's go back to being complacent, right? Um, but but a lot of times, if if you're looking to spend something significant, they they always have these agendas, right? Here here's here's our budget, here's our projects, and somebody else looks at that and says, well, that's expensive. We're going to cut that, and that's expensive. We're going to cut that. So security organizations within companies are not really running the security. It's all done by money, right? So you have compliance runs budget, right? Because you have to be compliant. But compliant doesn't always equal secure, so where's the balance there, right? Hit return. What? Hit return. Return? Yeah, okay. Did I go too fast? No, those were doubled. Oh. Okay. Um, so if you look out for, for um, threat intelligence, there's, there's, oh my gosh, there's a lot of external feeds you can get. A lot of it's all open source. And, and one of the problems is, you know, out of a hundred, how do you know which one, one feed is better for you versus another, right? Well, if you're in a manufacturing vertical versus a financial, so you kind of want to gravitate towards the manufacturing because it's kind of fits your need, but what do I need out of the financial portion of it? I mean, or do some of them intersect? So there are a lot of, of feeds, um, you know, choosing what's relevant. 
And then are you looking um, uh, for any kind of intelligence or in, uh, within the organization? And what I mean by that is when you do have a breach, whether it's ransomware or an actual uh, a breach of a larger scale, what did you learn from that? Right? Did you learn how they did that? Did, they le did you learn why they did that? Did you learn what tools they used? There's a lot of threat intelligence you can gather from the, your internal uh, organization. When you look at a firewall and it's blocking this particular IP address, well, well why? Why is it blocking that? Right? Is it because it's bad or because I have a policy in there? <clears throat> Uh, who owns threat intelligence? I mean, that's that's kind of a it's not a new word, but it's kind of a new group. Uh, people are, are creating their own threat intelligence groups and finding threat intelligence analysts and things of that sort. But they wonder, like, what group is that fall under? Is that a security thing? Is that a GRC thing? So a lot of times that that does become a problem. Um, not a lot of dedicated individuals or, or people that have the skill set for threat hunting and mitigating threats. Um, I, I do see that changing quite a bit um, just because it is becoming more and more uh, on, on the forefront of, of a lot of people. Um, it, it's not easy sometimes, right? Because you can see a lot of artifacts out there, a lot of IP addresses, a lot of hashes and so on and so forth, and you're like, well, which one's good, which one's bad? Why is it bad? Is it gonna still be bad? If it's bad on Monday, should it be bad on Wednesday? Right, so there's a lot of things that, that go on to um, uh, defining what threat intelligence is. And it, and, and it can be very overwhelming. Um, and, and putting that in your environment and making sense of it all, again, can be very painful because there's, you know, for example, we collect roughly five million artifacts a day, right? And through some programming and machine learning and some pixie dust, we kind of, you know, boil it down to what's, what is actually actionable. Uh, and if you were to do that yourself or within your own organization, sometimes that can be difficult to do. So zero day live. This this idea has the ability to, to spot these threats on the horizon, right? We know that like today, your firewall is blocking this IP address, but what do we want to block tomorrow, right? That's what threat intelligence should be. Instead of putting out, uh, instead of being reactionary, right? We're always reactionary. We're always getting in the office and saying, like, "Oh my gosh, I want to do this, but all these fires, I have to do all of this now first before I can tackle what I'm trying to do." And if I'm the network architecture or security architecture, I have to do that stuff too. Whereas if I just could kind of manage that threat intelligence a different way and actually predict what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, that my, my my job might be a little bit easier. And, and simplify all, a lot of these data, these threat feeds that, that are coming in to say, this, this is what this means, this is what this means. Let's kind of put it all together, mash it up, you either put it in our firewall or kind of put it into our sock and, and, and decide what are we going to do with it. What's the probability of that happening? What's the risk and, and, and things of that sort? You know, if it's, if it's a, a CentOS type of uh, risk and we have no CentOS in our environment, what do we care, right? <clears throat> so, our platform has that proprietary technology, and we've actually been able to predict a lot of these threats that are coming out. And that's a picture we have of our mobile app as well. <clears throat> so, we're looking at, so we do procure our own threat intelligence uh, through a lot of different dark websites, right? So I mentioned before, we gather roughly 5 million artifacts. And again, we, we boil those down for our customers based on what they're looking for. So we can kind of slice out whatever they want. So if you're in manufacturing and you want GDPR or you want things that are happening over overseas or manufacturing related stuff, we can do that. Or if you're retail, a lot of POS bugs, a lot of POS zero days, we can again slice that out and say, hey, these are some of the, the zero days from a POS standpoint that are coming out that you should be made aware of. If you have some type of EDR solution, we can provide you with that hash. And if you're doing hash blocking, we can say, hey, here's that hash. Because a lot of times, so there's in a ways to augment that EDR uh, solution because uh, we found a, um, not one threat so not one threat feed will will do the job for you right you you need to have multiple multiple uh, feeds 
Um, so we do have, uh, 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 I'll get into this a little bit later, uh, there's, there's four ways you can procure threat intelligence, one's through social media, one's through our sensor network, one's through the surface web, and one's through the dark web. And our, our, our um, the sensor network uh, has been providing a lot of this actual attention, uh, actionable intelligence uh, for us because we can spot trends, a lot of the analytics and things of that sort. And again, as I mentioned, for each customer, fully customizable, that's pretty much the only way threat intelligence works because not all threat intelligence is created equal. And if you just have a blanket, here's threat intelligence, what's valuable to you may not be as valuable to this person over here. So you, need, you do need to have that customizable functionality in there so that you can tailor or make that very bespoke uh, for your customers. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions so far? No? How, you know, how much time do I have? 40 more minutes? Okay, I'll be, I'll be done in five. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so here's, here's some of the differentiators. I don't know if you guys can see that way in the back. But what we're, what we're doing is we're providing a lot of unique indicators of compromise. Uh, and that's good for some of that analytical pieces, parts for your organization. You can prioritize these IOCs saying, hey, this one's more important to me because this is, can affect me a lot greater impact than this one down here below. So I can actually do a lot of that customization. Uh, we do uh, specialize and focus on a lot of the hacker tools, tactics, and, and procedures. So you, if in the threat intelligence world, it's called TTPs. So we've been building our, our, a lot of our um, information around what they're utilizing to attack you and why they're doing that. So that stat, what I mentioned, was 34.8% of the unknown. We're looking, hopefully, trying to reduce that significantly because we do know what tools, the tactics and procedures that, that these um, bad actors are u using um, to compromise organizations. Excuse me. And then the, the, the second and last one there is um, human, human and machine learning. So as I mentioned, again, five million artifacts, it all gets boiled down. We do have humans that actually look at it to, to validate that it is accurate so that we reduce false positives and we, we are providing true, actionable intelligence to our customers because one of the things that, I mean, it, it can't happen um, is providing them actionable intelligence that is a false positive, and we try to vet that out um, as best we possibly can by using human human interaction to to um, reduce that. So, some ways that that we can uh, this can be applied. Um, Ability to operationalize your cyber threats within your enterprise. So taking all these, and there's be another slide later on here, uh, taking all these bad IPs, taking all these hashes, these bad URLs, and basically automatically or you know every hour shoving them into your infrastructure. So if you do have a firewall that blocks bad IPs, instead of going out there and looking for bad IPs, we can just we can just shove them in there, update it every hour, put in three, four hundred in a day. Uh, your incident response technology to, to, to truly provide that post breach uh, to support that it, the, the identity and, and the containment uh, of that issue because a lot of times when, when somebody is attacked and they do have a breach, um, our vast amount of information, we can pretty much pinpoint uh, what, what that is if you have a sample. Uh, of what, what that is being attacked with uh, from a scripting or um, any kind of attack. Uh, we, we do have a, quite a bit of information in, in, in that library to do so. Anybody else have any questions so far? So I mentioned this uh, earlier about WannaCry, but the reason why I have it up here twice is because if, if you had that information or a threat against your company, you know, 15 days or even even 15 hours, what, what could you do with that kind of time, right? That That's pretty significant in the world of threat intelligence. You, you could potentially, you know, I don't want to say save the day by any means, but uh, you probably would get a raise or a bonus maybe. Um, 
to, you know, but that's that's what we're looking at. This this is pretty much the future of cybersecurity, right? Is to kind of you know get through the weeds, find the needles among needles, and saying, hey, this is really what's happening tomorrow. I mean, we already know what's happening today. We know my firewall is blocking this, this, and that, and we know our, all these URLs and categories that are being blocked. All right, we need to get out of that reactionary mindset and really move to that paradigm of being more proactive. <clears throat> so if you match up a lot of these problems with the solution, um, our, our DNA is all research-based, right? So, so again, we're looking uh, to separate that signals from the noise, right? We're trying to identify the real threats um, and, and using that deep analysis. And we have customized intelligence built around your, we call it Cyber 23. And what that basically essentially is, is if you take uh, like an authenticated scan of your organization, uh, we, we can populate that and, and in real time tell you that there's a zero day affecting windows and we know you have 15 windows and we know Gary owns all of these applications that are under that window so we're going to email Gary and say based on what you told us right because of your cyber 23 um, here's a zero day that just hit you need to, to do this to mitigate that today until a patch comes out so that that's again that's all automated it's all behind the scenes and that that's really you know how what we see is, is the future of of um, cyber intelligence truly and threat intelligence does that make sense <clears throat> So again, this is more geared towards potentially um, a manager or C-level, but I'm sure it, it pertains to all of us here in the room. Uh, time is money. Um, how many guys work over 40 hours a week? Okay, you got one, two, three. Anybody will work over 50? You got one. What about over 60? Okay, you got one guy back there. So if, if we, we all have this work-life balance thing, right, <laughs> that our companies try to promote, uh, working. <laughs> promote? <laughs> yeah. Promote? <laughs> they, they, they say it, right? They funny. No. But we got to understand that we go home at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock to be with our families or, you know, to go to the gym or do whatever, spend some alone time and Netflix and chill. Um, but at the end of the day, our adversaries are not doing that. They are not. They are literally in a, in a room with a pallet of Red Bull and saying, I need to do this. My family won't eat until this happens. This is how I survive. Right? So they don't have a punching in and out time frame. Then if you extrapolate that by thousands and thousands of people and nation states that are doing that, we don't, we don't stand a chance. We are always going to be two steps behind. And again, that's, I mean, it's not saying that we need to work you know, a million hours, but we just need to be working smarter and then how we approach that because our adversaries are doing that all, all day long. So your average cyber attack is roughly five and a half million dollars, right? But if you can reduce that time to identify and respond, so anybody that, that, that buys new hardware from a, a company that says, hey, you put this on your network, you're never going to get hacked. Well, that's kind of snake oil, right? But, but still, the idea is, is you're always going to get compromised. But your average compromise is, what, 220-ish days? Well, we want to reduce that to about six hours, right? Maybe eight hours. That's ideal. So, the, so that's really what, what a lot of these technologies, especially Zero Day Live, is trying to accomplish, is trying to, to, to find that within that six to eight hour window and basically just stop it right then and there. Right, so we don't have to wait the 220 days. We're not in the paper. Uh, nothing gets exfiltrated. Cross your fingers, um, and it, it, that's 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 a lot better scenario than than a lot of the other um, breaches we, we see on, on online and in the paper. So as I mentioned before, <clears throat> so these these are the the tiers of of things that are threat intelligent. So hashes, IPs, domain names, that's, that's pretty simple. I mean, you can get um, some of the, the scripting tools out there or some, you know, some, some free open source stuff out there to ingest that, right, and maybe put into some of your firewalls and things of that sort. Because that, that's, that's pretty popular stuff out there. People always kind of argue with me like, hey, you know, this bad IP wasn't in your database. I'm like, well, okay. 
I mean, that's that's okay. Um, but, that, but that's easy. But what's what's harder or more challenging is is the, the TTPs and the tools. How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? Why are they doing it to me? Right? That's a little bit more uh, tougher. But if you start to understand those pieces parts that everything else kind of falls into place that's that's how you how how we're how we have to evolve um, from looking at security so if because if we were to able to look at some of their tools can we somehow circumvent those tools that they're using right because so another person at a, a similar talk here said well what do i need threat intelligence for because you're always, always going to have one person that does the clicking Right, somebody's always going to click on something, and you're probably right. Right, so let's spend more money on education because that got us so far. Right, because if you're always going to have one person clicking, but once you want to understand what they're clicking on and why they're why they're sending it to that person, so you can stop it at the perimeter or stop it at the whatever solution. So if they do click, because you know they're going to click, great. I've already stopped it. No big deal. Right, so there's there's definitely some pros and cons to uh, a, a lot of the the in this stack of, of learning and, and getting a lot of the stuff in, into your environment. Anybody any questions? So th this 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 diagram here, I'll explain it to you here. It, um, is is what we see as the future of threat intelligence. Now, I'm not endorsing any of these products over here, but if you see all this internal stuff that you guys, you currently have a lot of that in your environment today, and you can learn a lot from what you currently have, right? When we call that internal threat intelligence, what these things are doing, why did we buy these? Why did we buy Palo Alto? Why did we buy Logarithm, right? Why did we buy Cisco? Why? To do some sort of function to block something. Right, because my boss told me to buy them. I don't know, right? But they're all doing something. And then you have the external threat intelligence, right? Your zero days, your malware, your phishing, a lot of your CVEs, your bad IPs, ransomware. That's all the stuff you, you, you don't know, right? And you don't really have time to do that because you're doing other things within the organization. You're doing architecture, you're doing putting out fires, you're putting in firewall rules. You're trying to find an exception because this URL isn't working, so I have to do a Wireshark and rah, right? Threat intelligence bridges the gap between your internal and external. It takes all this external stuff that you don't know and puts it into your internal environment. That's threat intelligence. That's that, that's what we see um, as the future. And it also provides immediate ROI on all the stuff you bought on the side here. So when you spend you know, a million dollars on XYZ technology, great. What's it doing? Because how many guys here bought a technology and you bought like five pieces parts of that thing, but you only have two, two of them turned on? I mean, is, is that pretty common, right? Well, why aren't you using all five? You bought all five. But it's just one of those things where we just kind of don't do that. We kind of have that great idea going into it, and I don't know. It's just we're failing <laughs> in a lot of ways. But in some ways, we're very, very successful. But this is what we see as threat intelligence evolving to. So we, we've so so. This slide is because I, I like this picture because we don't know really who that uh, attacker is, right? That's why I always have these faceless guys in hoodies. Um, but it, it, we, we built this for that purpose, right? We built it for one purpose and one purpose only, is to find threats for you and your organization to look ahead to predict what's going to happen uh, in that space. <clears throat> so if you look at uh, a lot of the, uh, the, there's a lot of threat intelligence companies out there, right? But we're, we're, we're seeing, we're uncovering roughly 30% more than our competitors, right? And that's huge. Because if you had a, a hash of a zero day before somebody else did, and it really protected your company, right? That, that's, you, you, you have now evolved into being proactive. So 
So when you're looking at threat intelligence as a solution, or even if you're trying to tinker with it at home or you know whatever, even at the office, there's there's uh, three different types of, of threat intelligence. You have tactical, raw, and finished. Uh, obviously, your tactical is very much your indicators of compromise, your bad IPs, hashes, so on and so forth. That's the easy stuff to get. Right, you can you can subscribe to the FBI bad IP list. I mean, we've been doing that for since what 1991. Um, but again, that becomes a full-time job. Saying, "Hey, I've got to remove this one, put this one in, and so on and so forth." But what you're really looking for is, is this finished type of of intelligence, because that's really uh, ready to be used and put in, in the context of what is going to actually happen to my organization. Is it, you know, from an impact, credibility, things of that sort. But that's very important to understand that there are certain different kinds of threat intelligence that you should be looking for um, when, when looking at uh, any kind of solution or if you're trying to get in that threat intelligence game. <clears throat> so here's an example. So if you look at company A and company B, as I say here, so what, what do they have that one other company doesn't have, right? Do they have malware hashes? Do they have botnet monitoring, right? So this is important when you're evaluating a lot of these solutions out there. Because again, what company A is looking for, what company B is looking for, it may be two different things. Well, I mean, you have to understand, like, why are you looking at threat intelligence? And then once you understand what your end game is, then you can say, okay, I'm going to take this vendor and this vendor and kind of piece it all together because they have this, and this is important to me. So a lot of times people say, hey, I want threat intelligence. I'm like, okay, what are your requirements? Oh, I don't know. I just want threat intelligence. It doesn't always work well, but you need to have some type of business case or some kind of technical case or use case for that. So it is very important to understand what these different companies have from a raw and or technical uh, information standpoint. And again, here, who has finished intelligence, right? I want something that's very actionable for me as an organization. So I, I need, I require this type of finished intelligence. So again, when you're doing that compare and contrast between uh, uh, you know, multiple organizations, that's very important to understand what it is that they're uh, comparing against. So, so I mentioned this before, your surface, deep, uh, your dark web, sensor networks, and social media. It's also very important to understand where they're procuring their data from. If you're looking at threat intelligence and they have their surface web or their or their social media, you know, above 50, 60 percent, that's really not threat intelligence. You, you really have to look at the value from a dollar standpoint of what you're getting and what you're spending. If you want true threat intelligence, that deep dark web has to be very high. It should absolutely be high. So your, your two should be deep dark web and sensor network. Okay, those should be. Those should far exceed 70%, 70, 80% for, for, for both of those. And then your, social, your surface and your social media, very much on, on, the, on the lower end. Because again, social media is not threat intelligence. Surface web, it really isn't because it's, it's, you know, it's on the surface. Anybody can Google that, right? It's that dark web sensor network that not everybody knows about. Right, so so the higher the dark web, the, the the more validity or the more value that threat intelligence would bring to your organization. Anybody have any questions on that? No. So everybody has to have their their Gartner or or Forrester research. So so we, we provide a lot of this input to Gartner um, to kind of validate what we've been doing in, in our space. There is no magic quadrant for threat intelligence. Um, will there be one? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I guess if somebody throws enough money at it. Um, but again, it, it's one of those things that they wrote a paper on. They asked for some of our input on that and how we do it differs greatly from a lot of other organizations and how they do it. Uh, but again, this is just a testament that w we're, we're, we're looking at it certainly from a dark web uh, standpoint and trying to put a lot of that data and that information into your, your infrastructure from an organization standpoint. So this unique product qualified team, right? So if you look at cybersecurity market value, that's $232 billion. 
It's a lot of money. So it's not going anywhere. Um, I, I like to think that um, a lot of pe a lot of companies that you see in the news. That's still why we have jobs, right? To keep us secure, right? But again, I think it's only becoming more and more of an issue. Truly. So that, that's that's a lot of money. That's my presentation, guys. You guys have any questions? I'll give you back 20 minutes of your time. And if you guys are around, stop by our table. We can actually show you the little thing about what you use. I'd be glad to do that if you're interested. If you haven't already had a list of you already, some of you probably already have. No questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Right.